Welcome to BAM It with John, Michael, and Mari, covering all things business, accounting, marketing, management, and IT. The place where businesses and entrepreneurs find the forest through the trees. Hello and welcome to BAM It. This is, of course, Mari Peterson with Marketing Outpost as your host. And of course, we have with us... Are you looking at me, Martin John Michael Cletus with Peridot Consulting? And we are your fabulous co-hosts for today's episode, and today we're going to be featuring John Michael is going to be talking about payroll and not how to avoid taxes, but what is payroll? What are the taxes involved? I'm saying this. He's giving me that look like, oh, my God, you cannot say that, which is what I always do anyway. (laughs) But anyway, we want to say thank you for joining us, and let's start off with the interesting fact of the day. So, what is your interesting fact, John Michael? Uh, so, since we're talking about payroll, they, they you know, the archaeologists uh, found old what they call pay stubs from uh, Egypt and, and Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia, did I say that right? Mm-hmm. And that uh, evidently they used to get paid in beer and other commodities, which I don't know why they ever changed that. Actually, well, it really hasn't changed. I do know employers, like especially in the restaurant business and other people, that will include in their pay kind of a comp, let's say a meal, or usually it's meals, but it could be other services that they already provide. Well, and there's also bartering, which is a mm-hmm. form of that. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, you do something, you, and the old everybody knows the doctor that made the house calls and would get you know, a dozen eggs and a chicken or something. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I guess that's an old bartering thing. You know, another thing is that uh, people that actually do get paid money, the the most frequent payday is every other week. So every two weeks is is like 37%. And right behind that is bi-monthly, which is sort of the same thing, but not really. I have this recurring nightmare. I don't know if it's a nightmare or a dream. I used to work for some place where you had to have in your time sheets by a certain time or you didn't get paid. And so I have this recurring nightmare that I have not turned in my time sheets and I'm not going to get paid. <laughs> I well, don't you- know. But it used to stick because I would like make sure I had it written everywhere to turn in my time sheet by X date. And then they would change the schedule around. It was really weird. So you were kind of like not sure if it was this. So you were constantly checking your calendar to see if the timesheets were due. It drove me nuts. It yeah. wasn't consistent. And then, but if you missed it and the accounting lady wasn't very nice, then you were just screwed. The accounting lady, not nice. Imagine that. The accounting lady. Well, I will nice. say the payroll clerk. <laughs> I guess that's what they no, call them now. But I'm yeah, kidding. so I have that nightmare about not turning in my timesheets. Well, there's that <laughs> reoccurring dream that many people have, like very, very similar to that, but it's they forgot about homework or there's this class that they forgot about or they didn't, you know, and, and everybody's stressed. And they actually, when you read the meaning behind that, it just means you've got a lot going on and you're just frankly afraid you're forgetting to do something you know you got so much to do geez i wonder why i have that dream. <laughs> yeah i have that dream probably uh three days a week i think we could do a whole segment on business dreams yeah exactly <laughs> well the uh the president of the united states do you know how much he gets paid per year not the current like for the actual salary of president like 140,000 or something they, they upped it a few years ago i think under uh eight W uh, under W Bush to four hundred thousand a year is the oh, presidential what was salary. I think in one hundred and forty. It was at one point like one hundred and fifty or two hundred, oh. and it was like that for the longest time. But finally, I think they raised it. Uh, you know, in the early two thousands, and then they get a annual pension for the rest of their life of two hundred thousand a year. Yeah, but when you think about everything that they do and what they're in charge of, that just seems really low when you well, look at these, you know, celebrities and sports stars. Or just to look at an executive 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 salary of like uh, uh, GMs getting like you know fifty million a year or something, and our president. Yeah, it's a lot of money, but no, it's not a lot of money when you compare it to executive salaries not at all i don't know if that means executive salaries are just way grossly overpaid well, executive salaries celebrities sports stars i mean they get paid for 
producing, you know, people that are going to, I guess, go see their stuff or buy their stuff. Yeah, but, but all these, the same. these presidents as well are making more than that because, yes, they have speaking. Yes, they have They're going to all write books. They got, you know. They so get a library named after they them. Are, you know, just like the celebrities that use their name to their benefit. These presidents are doing the same thing. So I'm not going to. If you're a president, I'm sure you're going to be making more than 400000 a year. It's just that the taxpayers are giving them 400 thousand a year to do what they do and free housing so that's not bad do you know what our congress people get paid uh it starts 140 isn't it i think maybe that's where i got my number yeah yeah i think it starts there yeah and if you make it two years i think you get permanent that's when you're like bought in well everybody makes it two years i think it's if you make it through one election i think it's four years. one election four you, years. you get the uh, pension and then you get like forever health care you know, all those things. It's good to work in government. Yeah, so they write it for themselves. Well, anyways, on the subject today about payroll. So I guess I get this question a lot because, first of all, like who, when do you need to do payroll, especially if you're self-employed? So you've got the entities, we've talked about it uh, random times and in uh, past podcasts, but you've got uh, either you're self-employed, uh, which means you have no legal entity, basically. You can be an LLC, an S-Corp, or a C-Corp. And if you're the only person in this business self-employed, you do not have to pay yourself a, a W-2, a, a quote-unquote salary. You just sort of take money out of your business and you get taxed on on whatever the income is of the business. If you're an LLC and you're the only owner of this LLC, um, same thing. IRS says it's a disregarded entity. You don't have to give yourself a W-2 or do payroll. Even if you're an LLC and you become a partnership, owners in an LLC do not pay themselves a W-2. They do what they call guaranteed payments. So sometimes it's a misconception that if, you know you might think that if you're an LLC, you got to start paying yourself a W-2. You don't because you take payments out in a different way and all your income is going to be taxed on self-employment taxes, which we're going to get in more detail in those self-employment taxes. So the big thing is if you're individually owned business and you decide to do a S corp or a C corp, suddenly you got to start doing payroll. Now in all these entities, even if you're self-employed, if you hire employees, you will have to start doing payroll. This is just paying for yourself. So if you're by yourself, you don't have to do payroll unless you do an S corp or a C corp in any situation you if you have employees you do have to start doing payroll so uh what does that mean to have to start doing payroll that means you better have some cash in the <laughs> bank well i mean obviously or if a you're, line of credit well you don't want to go into debt paying people but no but a lot of people do <laughs> startups maybe uh but you don't want to pay I mean, you're just paying somebody for their work. So what happens is, and excuse my language here, whenever we talk about the uh, extra costs of doing payroll, the number one cost is what I call the PETA cost. Have you ever heard of the PETA cost? Is Marie? that pain in the ass? It's the pain in the ass cost. <laughs> exactly. Well, that's what I call certain clients. I've never once ever referred to any of my clients in that way, Marie. <laughs> <laughs> You, <laughs> Everybody has a PETA client. You can't nope. tell me that you don't. I don't. <laughs> Everybody but, has a PETA but, client. But, you know, uh, for example, if you're going to be an S-Corp, you probably will start saving taxes on day one if you're an S-Corp. However, does those tax savings outweigh those PETA costs? And there's actual out-of-pocket costs, too, because um, the... Uh, out-of-pocket costs of administrative, uh, you know, the extra payroll taxes, which we'll get into in a minute. If you do a payroll service, if you do go into an S-Corp or C-Corp, suddenly you have to do an other tax returns. you got extra tax prep costs. Those are out-of-pocket costs. The PETA cost is, you know, when is it that inconvenience, that pain in the ass uh, of having to do it, when does that get outweighed? When do the tax savings outweigh that? And uh, that's sort of what... you every person has to measure for themselves. They may, the tax savings may be a thousand bucks and they still may say, well, I have to do this every quarter and do all these payrolls and stuff. I'm just, I don't want to do that. I'm not going to start paying myself anything because it's just not worth that thousand dollar tax savings. Other people might say, heck yeah, for a thousand bucks, I'm going to do that. So that's an internal measurement. When I meet with clients, I kind of go through the hard costs 
the potential tax savings, and they weigh the PETA costs themselves on if it's worth them doing it or not. Now, eventually, obviously, tax savings will weigh outweigh that PETA cost, and it kind of becomes a thing. And, and especially if you with payroll, you can outsource it completely, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then it's really the PETA cost is greatly minimized, just your out-of-pocket cost is increased at that point. As with anything... But you're talking about self-employed payroll. Self-employed payroll, yeah. If you have employees, you got to... Yeah, self-employed, there's a PETA cost that you got to uh, uh, factor in. So that is why you would have to do payroll if you have employees, obviously, or if you decide to do an S-Corp or C-Corp as a self-employed individual, you then will have to start doing payroll for yourself. You can no longer just take what they call as uh, draws, distributions, or dividends. You still may be able to still do that, but you have to start implementing uh, wages to yourself as an S-Corp. And what does payroll taxes mean? It means that you're on a quarterly basis, at least, uh, reporting to the IRS. You're reporting something to the state that you're in. And you're also reporting something to the state unemployment, uh, you know, the Department of Commerce. Uh, and on who a does this basis. reporting? The business does. So either who in the business? Well, it could be the homeowner. I mean, the the homeowner, the business owner. The, if you only if you're one business, mm-hmm. it's you. Well, what I'm getting at is typically um, a business if they have multiple employees, it's a bookkeeper in house, or they outsource it. To their accountant? Oh, yeah. I mean, there's all types of options, which we'll get into. But Mm -hmm. the business is responsible. So if it's just you and you don't have the funds to completely outsource it, then you've got to do it. You know, the business is... You just want to make sure you're doing it right. That's why a lot of people have somebody. Yeah. Or they reach out. A lot of times I'll talk to clients. I'm like, look, I'll hold your hand. The thing is, I've always said about payroll. I'm an accountant and go on record saying this is I hate payroll. It's a pain in the butt. It's annoying. It's a PETA. It's a, it's a PETA. It is annoying. But one thing about it is it's routine. Is that you do it once, yeah, it's terrible. You do it twice, it's still terrible. You do it the third time, it's still terrible, but at least it's routine. You're catching on to it. And it's just something you got to do. And eventually, some people don't mind it. They're like, oh, this is easy. I could do it myself. Other people, there's just so much going on, especially if you get more and more employees. It's probably better to outsource it because you're trying to work on other parts of your business and it's not worth the uh, weekly or bi-weekly or bi-monthly burden of doing payroll. And some payroll software, which we'll get into in a minute, is very, can be very turnkey, but you're paying for it. You know, just as with anything in America, you, you can, it can be as easy or as hard as you want, as long as you pay for it or if you don't want to pay for it. So every quarter, if you start paying yourself every quarter, you got to do a tax reporting form to the IRS. It's called a 941. A 941 is what you've got to uh, submit. It's got how many employees you had for that quarter, what were your total wages for that quarter, and then you break out your Social Security and Medicare taxes. Those are the big that you're only going to see when you do payroll. You're only going to see Social Security and Medicare. When you're self-employed, you don't see it broken out as Social Security and Medicare. You see it and it's called self-employment taxes, but that is Social Security and Medicare. When you actually do these 941s and W-2s, you see it broken out. You're, just because you're self-employed doesn't mean you're not paying it. You're definitely paying it. So you have to do that 941. You have to do a quarterly report to the state. Same thing, showing the wages paid. And then um, you, you got to do the, the income tax withheld. So there's three taxes that you're paying every time you do payroll. Social Security, Medicare, that's two. And the third one is income tax. And uh, Social Security and Medicare are uh, are very mechanical. Uh, Social Security is uh, 6.2% per uh, to, to be taken out of your employee, but it's total 12.4%. So if you pay somebody $100, $12.40 is going to Social Security. 6.2 comes out of their wages. The that, other 6.2 gets paid by the employer. That uh, percentage hasn't changed much, has it? No. They've, I remember that's being the same percentage like over 10 years ago. Yeah, it's been roughly the same. How come and then, that hasn't changed? Well, it's the politicians that said it, and it's a very hot button issue. What they've done, though, is they've... So Social Security tax stops 
at the I think the the max I think right now is at one hundred and thirty nine thousand, which means if you get paid one hundred and thirty nine thousand, you're going to get six. You know, the employer is going to pay six point two. Of the one hundred thirty nine thousand. Yes, if, if you, you get, make two hundred thousand, then that difference is not. Yeah, between one thirty nine and two hundred does not have social security. It stops. But what they do is they increase that base is another way of kind of increasing it. And it does kind of increase a little bit every year. But then there's Medicare tax and it's 1.45% and it doesn't have a cap. So if you make a salary of 500000 a year, 1.45% will go to Medicare. And this is always confusing because it is a total, if you add Medicare and Social Security, it is a total 15.3%. But the employee pays half or it comes out of their wages. The other half comes out of the employer. Now, what happens if you're self-employed? You're your own boss and your own employee. You're paying 15.3%. It's coming out of both your pockets. What's the total of the taxes the employer pays percentage-wise? Well, it's all the taxes. Well, it's the Social Security is 7.65% plus uh, the, the half of the Medicare, which is one45 so they the employer pays that, and then out of the employee wages is the other half. So the total is fifteen point three. So half is seven point six five because uh, the employer seven point six five comes from the employer. Well, the reason I ask that is people used to always ask me, okay, if I start having employees and I pay somebody thirty thousand dollars, then what else do I need to budget for? And I've always told them. If you have benefits, it's approximately 30% more if your benefits are really good. In most cases, you need to budget at least 20% on top of your salary because that's about what all the taxes add up to. 7.65. But it's more than that when you add in all the other costs. So we always, we always just used a 20%. Number. Well, that's rounding up a bit. Yeah. No, I mean, so the actual extra, so for every $100 you're paying somebody, you're paying another $7.65 on top of that. So the tangible extra tax you're paying is 7.65. Now, of course, if you have payroll fees, those payroll fees, generally, they just add another 3 to $10 per employee. So that's not too much for like administrative costs. Obviously, if you have benefits, that's... that's we always just, rounded it up. Benefits and taxes, we say on average, add another 20%. Well, that probably factors in admin costs of onboarding. If they're paying for health insurance, if they're paying for four hundred one k, if they're paying for well, if, yeah, I mean that's any that, of that stuff. I think anybody out there knows that if you have employees, um, but they just need to know a round percentage so they can budget accordingly. Well, I'd say it's a more budget is closer to ten percent, twenty percent. Like if you're factoring in health insurance and all this stuff that a lot of people don't have, and you don't have to provide until you get into a certain number of employees. So obviously, yes, if you are if you have 401k and stuff, it's that additional cost goes up exponentially. And it could be another 50%, depending, or, you know, uh, depending on where they are and their wages and all that. So it's... Uh, Back in the day when times were good, it was about 30%, but that was in a law firm and an accounting firm. So for between all the benefits and all that stuff, it was Yeah, and then there's... That. You got a vacation pay, holiday pay, mm -hmm. sick pay. I mean, who knows? Yeah. So, I mean, it's uh, there's many ways to to do the quick answer. The tangible answer is seven point six. But that's why so many employers want to have part time people, so they don't have all those extraneous costs. They're not having to pay for vacation or sick or health insurance or whatever. Yeah, and before the uh, health care law. You know, you didn't have to provide health insurance. It was more like a, a way of good retention and, and you know, it was a marketing thing, I guess, or a good employee uh, rule of thumb to offer these things. But now after the health care law, you don't have to give health insurance. But if you have 50 or more employees, you do have to give health insurance. So it's mandated that you provide this health insurance or you face hefty penalties. But let's go ahead and uh, take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll talk about you know, outsourcing it and other options there. This podcast is brought to you by Perido Consulting and Marketing Outpost. Perido Consulting offers a new paradigm in accounting services. We work with individuals and businesses toward prosperity and financial happiness. Please visit www.peridoconsultinginc.com for more information. Marketing Outpost provides strategies to solve problems and strategies to grow your business. 
please visit www.marketingoutpost.com for more information. Okay, and we're back from our break. And before we left, we were just kind of going through the the taxes, what they were, the the percentages, how often you've got to do it. Uh, and to round that out, you know, you do got to do a 941 every quarter. You've got to uh, report, you know, the wages, Social Security, send that money in on a on that quarter. If your wages are over a certain amount, you've got to do that on a monthly basis and then not do the 941 every quarter as a reconciliation. Then at the end of the year, you've got to do what they call a 940, which is like a reconciliation of all your 941s. And it also, that 940 uh, ties to all your W-2s. So then at that point, you mail out your W-2s and you have to have them in the mail by January 31st and, and filed by February 15th. And everybody, I'm sure at some point or has or will get a W-2 and uh, your employer has had to do all this stuff throughout the year and all that reporting. So, you know, if you do it yourself, you got to be on top of it. You got to have all of that stuff going on. Uh, What a lot of people do is they look into outsourcing. There's plenty of third party ways to do it. There's kind of a hybrid between doing it yourself and not an an example. What are the penalties if you do it wrong? Well, it just depends on what you did wrong. If you underpaid, there can be, uh, I don't know the exact penalty. It's not like they have a, uh, you did it wrong penalty, but it depends on what you did. If you underpaid, I've had tax situations where people come to me and this is a terrible story, but they had a business, they paid employees, they gave them their net paychecks, which means they withheld their from their pay federal income tax withholding, which is its own thing. They withheld Social Security, they withheld Medicare, and gave them their net check, which they should do. But they never sent in any of those payroll taxes at all. Uh, <laughs> what were they doing? Were they using the money? Yeah, they just, the cash, they... The problem, the one thing that I... Hopefully that was not intentional. Well, it was this, it was a thing. I don't want to get into more details than I have to, but it was a thing that it was, uh, I don't want to say not intentional, but it was definitely a conscious thing that was going on that they just didn't have the money. Because this is what happens. This is my advice is that you say you withhold, somebody gets paid on the 15th and the 30th and you withhold all their taxes on the 15th and you give them their net paycheck. And then, you know, between the 15th and the 30th, your your oven blows up in your kitchen and you have to like replace it. Come the 30th, you don't have any money and you're supposed to send off all these payroll taxes, like 5,000 of them, but you don't have it. Now, that's where you're in a big trouble because you didn't escrow those payroll funds away to send off. You had them, but suddenly you spent them. So now you owe these taxes and, and really you're just a middleman for these employees holding their withholdings. You're holding some of their payment that they should have gotten, but you're sending it off as federal withholding. You don't have the money, then you can get in trouble. Then there's penalties. You're not sending that off. And the employer gets in trouble. The employee will still get credit for their withholdings. And the employer will will have to make that up, pay it, pay the penalties, interest, whatever, and, and face the ramifications. The employee will still get credit as if those taxes were withhold. But I I highly recommend for those who are doing payroll to have a separate payroll account. And if you, you know, if your total payroll costs, taxes and everything are $5,000, put it in that account. The wages can come out of that account. So the leftover are your taxes and you don't touch it because it's not yours. And then when every month comes around or every quarter, you have the money there to send off. If you have this one account and it's all one big junk in, in, in one huge account and you look at the bank balance, you're like, oh, I've got $10,000. I'm going to go buy that stove. And then before you know it, the 30th rolls around and you owe $7,000 in payroll taxes and you forgot about it or not forgot or you just mismanaged or just weren't pre-planning or whatever the situation, you could be in a major pickle. So make sure you take those funds out as pay comes. Those are not, once that is paid and you pay that employee, that's not your money anymore, even though it's still in your bank account. It is not yours. Same thing with sales taxes. Not to digress, but if you collect sales taxes, you're just a middleman between the customer and the state. You should not spend that money for any other purpose than just sending it off to the state. So payroll taxes, I've seen situations where there's just internal mismanagement or cash flow issues and they're using money that they shouldn't be. But anyways, so there's 
you know, there's many ways to do payroll, obviously doing it yourself. The second way is a kind of a hybrid where you can get into a software like QuickBooks and they have payroll on QuickBooks where it kind of does the calculations, the hourly wages, breaks out the 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 SUDA and the FUDA unemployment and the, uh, which is another thing you got to do. You got to do state unemployment, the social security and Medicare. And then it tells you, okay, here's your net check and here's how much you send off to these agencies. It does all that for you and holds it. The uh, There's complete turnkey outsourcing. You know, people have heard of ADP or, or paychecks. There's one called Gusto where you pay them and they just do it and they can be as turnkey as calling you up once a uh, pay period saying, okay, we're going to draft out this much of your account for payroll and everything gets direct deposited into the accounts of the employees. We have a really nice uh, payroll uh, service through Perido that we offer. It's turnkey. It's cloud-based, really easy. The employee, I'm sorry, the employer logs in and puts in the hours. Everything calculates out and it drafts and direct deposits and, and does all the reporting and everything and also mails out the W-2s. You're done. So that's about as turnkey as you can get and stress-free as you can get. So you can get to that easy of a level or do it all yourself, which is obviously more uh, of a burden and that PETA cost weighs in. When does it become worth uh, that extra fee to outweigh that PETA cost of doing it myself? One thing, if you have more than three employees, you have to get a uh, workman's comp. That's an insurance issue, but it's something that should be noted. Some people might have seven employees and have never thought about it. I always say, talk to your insurance person. Your insurance person probably should be asking about that. It is an insurance thing. It's nothing that a tax accountant will do for you, but you do have to get workman's comp insurance after three employees. And it's generally not too burdensome. It depends on the coverage and everything, but it's you know, just something you have to pay once a year or something to cover that. But anyways, Mari is, I'm trying to keep Mari awake with my interesting. Uh, it's not that, I'm just tired. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Mari. Coming in on a, on a hard work month and listening to me talk about payroll taxes. When you, there's some compliance things. When you hire somebody, you should have them fill out a W-4. A W-4, what that does is it tells you, uh, you know, their name, address, and social, things you do need to know, tells you other things. Now, the W-4 used to, and it still does, ask you, like, how many, you know, do you put zero, one, two, three, or four for how many exemptions you want? Now, the odd thing about that is in this new tax law that just passed um, for 2019, passed last December, they got rid of the exemptions. So that whole zero one two three four thing is kind of an irrelevant question now. And they have gone back and forth on a brand new W-4 with a couple of drafts in the associations, the AICPA and the National Association of Enrolled Agents and all these associations keep kicking it back because um, it's gone from this one page W-4, you know, name, address, phone number, exemptions to like a two page thing that basically looks like you're applying to a, for a bank loan. It asks for your like other income, what your expected wages are going to be, uh, what your spouse's in expected income is, all these very complicated questions. And it's because they just are, don't, they're trying to figure out an easy way to guesstimate what your federal and state withholding should be. And, and, and they still, frankly, are trying to figure that out. So one thing I guess we can get into is the difference between an employee and a contractor. We get that a lot. If, you know, an employee, you have them do a W-4. If you ever have a contractor out there, you want them to do a W-9, same thing, but it's just name, address, and social, and them signing it, attesting that this is their name, address, and social. If you have control on how the work is done and what will be done, then that meets the base criterion as an employee. A lot of times people are like, oh, I just want to pay him for a contractor for a while and then eventually I pay him as an employee. Well, sometimes you don't really have that choice. It's not a choice to say I'm going to pay them as an employee or a contractor. It's really what is the definition of what's going on? And they may be an employee from day one and, and you have to pay them as an employee and start doing the Social Security and Medicare withholdings and start doing all of that. There's also a type of employee in there that you're talking about exempt versus non-exempt. And that impacts the payroll because are you paying them hourly? Do they get overtime? 
all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. There's all types of considerations there. And, and if they're employee, suddenly if you do offer benefits, like Mario was saying, even if you're like, oh, I'm just, you know, I don't know if I want to hire this person or not. But if there is like a criterion for benefits and they're employee, they're, they're eligible, a contractor, there's no benefits. You don't pay their share of those self-employment taxes. The benefit, though, is that contractor gets to deduct any expenses. So if they are a contractor and they, you know, have their own tools or computer or whatever, they can deduct that against the income you pay them. Whereas an employee, if it's similar, but they meet the definition of employee, they can't deduct any of those expenses. But you are doing a W-2 for them and, and making their taxes a little more turnkey. So some people might say, I want to be a contractor because I have all these expenses that I can otherwise cannot deduct because I work from home or I do, you know, I travel a lot and the employer doesn't reimburse that. It just comes down to that base definition of, you know, are you an employee or not? And it's not necess- it's not a choice. You don't get to choose one or the other. It's de- are you defined as an employee or, an em- or a contractor? So when you have an employee, there's obviously all the record keeping requirements, uh, the you know keeping a minimum wage, all those things. And I mean, you know the difference between a contractor and employee. I think Mari, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's it's, oh, yeah. it's a common misconception. I mean, an easy example of a contractor is if you are in a business and you hire somebody to come in and you know fix your plumbing. <laughs> He's not that. He's not your employee for the day. He's doing it how he does it with his tools, how he wants to do it. He's wearing his own work shirt, those sort of things. But if you hire somebody to come in and work on a project uh, with you for a month, and they're wearing your shirt because you're meeting with the client, and you want them to be representing you because you're getting paid. You're telling them how to do it. You're saying you need to get here at nine tomorrow, and I'm going to pay you ten dollars an hour. All these things, and then even though it may only be for a month or a thing, they and they may be your employee. So there, there can be gray area. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't. To get into contractors, uh, any questions about any of this, Mario, about uh, W-2s or employees or payroll taxes that maybe I didn't cover? No, I think you got most of it. Okay. Before we go, and I, and I, and I give Mari her reprieve of the day, I do just want to briefly talk about on the contractor's uh, I will. I just decided I'll cover it here because it's such a small thing. A lot of times I get the question on when should you give somebody a 1099. Well, 1099 is if they are a contractor and you pay them more than $600 and you paid a non-employee. They did do a service uh, for your trade or business and it's an individual, a partnership, then you have to give them a 1099. And uh, 1099s actually are kind of like the catch-all of reporting requirements. You got W-2s, which are wages. 1099s, you report any, anything from rents to royalties to other income to fishing boat proceeds, medical and health care payments. Non-employee compensation, mine seven, is where you would pay contractors and everything. That's probably the most common use of a 1099 is nine seven non-employee compensation. But you use that 1099 for everything. If you pay somebody, if they are, are an individual or a partnership, you have to give them a 1099 and uh, if it's over $600. So that's sometimes a common misconception. And if you have to do that, when you do a 1099, you have to know their name, social, their address. And sometimes people are like, oh, I never got that. And the person refuses to give it to them. They're like, I'm not, I don't want a 1099. I'm not going to give that to you. I thought this was a cash deal. No way. Well, the person that's supposed to give the 1099 is the one that gets penalized. You can be penalized like, you know, pretty hefty amounts for not doing a 1099 when you were supposed to. So you can be in trouble for that. So I say, always try to get the, if you're going to hire somebody, have them do that W-9 so you have it and they know up front. If they don't want to do it, don't hire them. Because, what if their address changes and it comes back to you? Uh, well, then that's out of your control. At least you're reporting it to the IRS. And there are situations where you can still do the 1099. You just have to mark, you know, refuse to give the social security number. And at least you're reporting it and getting it out there. If they uh, have social security numbers that start with a nine, it's usually like uh, immigrants that have that. Uh, you're required to withhold federal taxes on some of that. So there are things to be aware of with contractors and stuff that increase your reporting requirements. 
that otherwise you're thinking you're just hiring somebody to come work, you know, to fix that plumbing in your uh, kitchen at the work office. And uh, suddenly there's a 10 I non reporting requirement that you maybe didn't know about. So you got to be aware of that. But hopefully I covered all things payroll. I think that you covered all things payroll. Oh, hey, look. I, uh, and 1099s. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was just a little thing I decided to add in at the end because it's a common question that I figured this would be a good Bonus discussion. Question. Bonus. Bonus 1099 discussion. So do you have anything else to add? I guess not. Well, then I'm going to say thank you for joining us today. And please be sure to review this episode. For more information on who we are or this podcast, of course, visit our website at www.bamit.com. That's B-A-M-M hyphen I-T dot com. And on our next episode, we are going to be interviewing. We will be interviewing Christy Kay of Express Employment Professionals talking about hiring employees and what to look for and interviewing. Thank you. The hosts and the guests of this podcast make no warranty, guarantee, or representation as to the accuracy or sufficiency of the information featured in this podcast. The information, opinions, and recommendations presented in this podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done at your own risk. This podcast should not be considered professional advice and is for entertainment purposes. It is not guaranteed that you will find this as entertaining as the hosts find themselves.